Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. This is our 2022 YouTube Studio Tour. And this is the first episode of a new series that we're going to call Backstage, a series where we're going to take you behind the scenes of this YouTube channel and the business that surrounds it. And I'm going to share the lessons and trials and tribulations that we've learned along the way so that you can hopefully learn something to apply to your own creator or entrepreneurial endeavors. Firstly, I'm going to show you a tour of the studio itself. And then secondly, we're going to show all the different setups that we have, the working setup, the podcast setup, the live stream setup, the YouTube main channel filming setup. And then at the end, we're going to break down the finances of this place, how much it costs and is it really worth it to to spend this much money on a fancy studio in central London. Anyway, let's start with this area. This is one of the co-working areas. It's a communal area, but because our office is on this floor, we're generally the only ones who are here. And so it sometimes does feel like a bit of a private space. This is the gallery where sometimes we film videos. Sometimes we have the team doing co-working. It's really nice. Sky roof light thing, loads of natural light free tea, free coffee, free honey that I like to squeeze into my mouth sometimes because it helps me kind of get my voice ready for doing videos. And it's broadly a pretty solid place to work from when, for example, we've got filming happening in the studio and the team happen to be here, they tend to work from here. Now, the other communal parts of the building are, firstly, there is a cafe downstairs, which is rather nice. That's where we get my cheeky lattes from. Secondly, there is a reading room, which is a nice quiet plate. Again, really solid natural light where we can do Zoom calls or do some working. And there's a bunch of conference rooms as well, which we book out when we need to do like a strategy meeting or something. And there's other stuff going on in the studio itself. So that was a quick tour of the communal aspect of the building that we're in. Let's now look at the studio itself. So we're going to start off with a little tour of the whole place, and then I'm going to break down all of the, all of the different setups that we have, the working setup, the podcast setup, the YouTube video filming setup, the live streaming setup, which is all in this one room, which admittedly is kind of small, but seems to get the job done. So let's kick things off with a kind of tour in this direction. We have over here desk and desk. There is Jana, one of our interns. We have these whole docking stations with computer monitors everywhere. We've got Sam, one of our interns. We've got Jamie, our YouTube producer, who helps out with titles and thumbnails and all that fun stuff. And a bunch of other team members who are not here today because it's a filming day rather than a working day. Anyway, we have these desks, courtesy of Herman Miller, which is awesome. And basically the idea is that um, anyone in the team can sit at any of these desks and they can just plug in their MacBooks. We get MacBooks for everyone on our team and they will just work with these LG monitors or that Asus monitor or these Apple monitors. Moving along here, we have on Yana's desk, this is a standing desk, so it's height adjustable. And we have a little upload station on this side where we have a Mac mini, which is connected via wired ethernet to multiple SD card readers and CF Express card readers and stuff. And this is the Mac mini that can stay on at all times, basically, if we need to upload footage overnight to our editors, because one of our editors, Christian, is in Romania, and we also use this to back up all the footage that we have. And then, you know, computer monitor, stand, keyboard, the whole shebang over here. We have over here a whole bit of storage for all of the camera gear. We got a bunch of t-shirts. Last time we did a part-time YouTuber Academy event, and we had a load left over, so they're all in a box over here, along with tote bags and stuff, slider, tools, very helpfully labeled. We have a box full of essentially merchandise. If you didn't know, I designed a stationary line a few months ago and we've been selling this stuff. So if we have friends or family or podcast guests or other YouTubers that come to the office, we give them free stationery as a bit of a present. Moving along here, we have some more desks. Now, the nice thing about these tables is that most of them are on wheels, which means we can move things around as we need to. This is the Herman Miller sail chair, which I've had for many years. It's the one that I brought over from my place in Cambridge. That that Sam is sitting on is the Herman Miller M-Body. The one that Jana is sitting on is the Herman Miller Mirror 2. So we've got these three blue and white kind of themed chairs. And then all the other chairs that we've got in the studio are Herman Miller Cosms. And the nice thing about these is that they're not particularly adjustable, except for the height. And so anyone can just sit in them and it's a very comfortable chair to get any work done. And we have these other two tables, which we often use for the podcast, as you'll see in the podcast setup, where if we have more people in the studio, people can work from here or here or there or there. And so four people, sometimes three, and a bit of a squeeze can fit onto this space that we've got. 
over here. We have a couple of these other kind of, again, on wheels, drawer units where we store SD cards. We've got like a bunch of, you know, memory cards need uploading, memory cards ready for reuse. So <laughs> a few helpful labels to keep track of all of the stuff we've got going on with the YouTube videos and the podcast and the courses and the live stuff that we film here in the studio. Then moving along, we have more desk stuff. We have the Pro Display XDR monitor, which is totally not worth it. And we have Jamie here whose laptop is connected to that. And Jamie is currently working on some thumbnails, which is awesome. And then over here, we have like a bunch of storage space. So this is, I think from Ikea. And we have charging stations for all of the batteries. We have camera gear, we have microphone cables, and we have these drawers which have our monitors. We have a drawer for camera lenses. And we have a random drawer of miscellaneous stuff with other stuff in boxes where, you know, usually camera bodies we stick on the top of this, camera lenses we stick underneath. And it's basically a storage space for anything that needs storing. Moving along, we have a couple of plants. This one is a little bit on its last legs which is kind of sad, um, but the rest of them are reasonably healthy. And this is like the music corner. Uh, this is the guitar that I've had for many years that I brought over from Cambridge when I moved to London. This is a new keyboard that we got, which is nice. Uh, we've got the cajon where you can sit and play the drums if you really want to. And this is where my singing teacher, Josh, comes along twice a week and I have singing lessons because I've been working on singing lessons because it's kind of fun. And we also have in our musical setup, we have a little ukulele. Um, and occasionally I will just serenade people in the team uh, and they are polite enough not to kind of tell me to shut up. We have this thing over here, which is a bookcase. Uh, I think it's meant to be like a console unit for like TV and stuff, but we don't have a TV or any consoles. We just have a load of books and they've been conveniently almost like color coded. All the black ones, the white ones, the orange to blue to blue and white. Um, we have this little, I think it's an olive tree or a lemon tree or something like that with these little fairy lights on it, which is kind of cute. And we have another bookshelf, which is usually the backdrop of most of my YouTube videos. Oh, the air conditioning here is currently quite nice. And again, some books color coded. And you can check out that video over there to see a tour of the bookshelf. Then finally moving along this way, we have where the place where we put a load of other camera gear. So tripod on wheels. We like to have things on wheels because it just makes it a lot easier to move things around. If you see stands, this is the Aperture, I think 300D. Um, it's a light that we use for a lot of things. We have another light over there, the 120D. We have these acoustic blankets that we occasionally use if uh, audio quality is particularly important for a thing that we're working on. And that is basically the space. Oh, and also there is a balcony. Currently it's ridiculously hot and bang in the middle of the day, but there's a balcony outside, which is just for us. And usually, you know, if it's a nice day, we'll go outside onto the balcony and we'll eat lunch over there or just hang out over there. And then at the back over here, we have just, <laughs> again, random storage space with a ton of boxes. I think the next studio, the next office we move into, I definitely want to have loads more storage space because I really underestimated how much storage we'd need for all of the random stuff that just sort of accumulates over time when you run a business and when you do stuff. And then we have my <laughs> wardrobe where I've just taken over time, just brought in shirts from my house and brought them over to the studio so that if we're filming multiple videos in a day, I can change my top and look somewhat presentable. All right, so that was a quick tour of the studio and this working setup. This is kind of the default mode that the studio tends to be in, but we change up the configuration of the studio depending on what we need to do in terms of filming podcasts or filming YouTube videos or doing live streams of Zoom sessions for our part-time YouTuber Academy. So we're now gonna show you what the podcast setup looks like and how this place transforms into a podcast studio. Right, so this is the podcast setup for the Deep Dive with Ali Abdal podcast. I'll show you what the setup is. Uh, essentially, we have three camera angles. We have a Sony A7, A7C currently shooting the wide angle with the 24 millimeter G Master lens on f5.6. And we have two Sony A7S3 cameras with 85 millimeter lenses, usually at like f1.4 or a low f-stop to get that sweet blurry background. And the cool thing about these, all of these is that, well, these two, is that we have the Peter McKinnon variable ND filters on them, which are like sunglasses for the lenses. And that's ideal because the lighting conditions vary significantly. We have this setup over here, which is the Aperture 300D Mark II. Now in terms of audio, what we have is these Shure SM7B microphones, which we've got these custom blue 
thingies for because we like blue and white. Uh, it's annoying that the, uh, it's very disconcerting that you're looking at me like, it's fine. Sorry, it's, no, it's all good, it's all good, man. Uh, it's, it's kind of annoying that the microphone stands are black. It's surprisingly hard to find a white microphone stand because we're all about white and blue here. So if anyone wants to manufacture or invent one or come over and spray paint it, uh, then do please let us know. These microphones are connected via XLR cables to this bad boy. This is the Cloud Lifter, which uh, provides clean gain to the microphones or something like that. And these are connected via XLR inputs to the Zoom H6 audio recorder. Is this the same company as makes Zoom the thingy software? I don't think it is. Weirdly, they're both called Zoom. Well, it does kind of look like a similar logo. I don't know. Either way, um, yeah, XLR input from these feeds straight into the Zoom H6, and this is recording to an SD card. Very excitingly as well, we have an even fancier thing going on here. So all of these cameras are connected via HDMI, and they're all connected to this, the Atomex Cast, which accepts up to four HDMI inputs. And now this is essentially connected to our Pro Display XDR over here through this MacBook. So what we can do is, by pushing numbers on the thing, we can change the camera angle. Look at that. Doesn't that look freaking incredible? Oh, wow. Doesn't that just look freaking incredible? Um, this is a bit extra for the podcast. Uh, essentially with the podcast, what we do when we have these, we have someone over here who is like switching camera angles. And usually we live stream the podcast over Zoom uh, to our team. Because often the team will be like, oh my God, you're interviewing someone cool. Why don't we just hop on a Zoom call and live stream it? Uh, we are thinking about live streaming the podcast generally. We'll think about that at some point further down the line. But it also means that when we switch these angles, we can create a rough cut of the podcast episode as well, which has all, already all the camera angles flipped around, which means that if an editor needs to save time, they could potentially take the rough cut that we create on the fly and use that to essentially tweak uh, to build the podcast episode out of. But this isn't just our podcast setup. This is also our setup for uh, Q and A's that we do for our part-time YouTuber Academy. So for example, when me and Elizabeth are doing like a group Q and A, uh, people in the audience will ask questions and we'll be giving our different perspectives and someone will be kind of essentially switching the camera angles and that will be broadcast over Zoom because this is our live cohort YouTuber Academy. More details in the video description if you want to check it out. It runs a few times a year. It's pretty fun. Uh, but then as Elizabeth and I are answering questions, we're, we're sort of switching the camera angles as we go along. And people's minds get absolutely blown by this because they've never seen a Zoom setup that looks so pro where it's like two people are answering questions from the audience, but the cameras are switching around and it looks as sick as this. And yeah, this setup over here is also quite handy for a podcast producer, Amber, who sometimes is in the studio, like listening to the podcast live as it's happening and taking notes. But sometimes if she wants to work from home or if it's just better for, generally it just, it feels a bit more intimate when it's a podcast interview, especially if the, especially if the guest doesn't have that much experience being on podcasts, if there are fewer people in the studio. So this is really handy. It's just a way of being able to live stream it to her on Zoom, wherever she is in the world. And then she can take notes on the episode as it's going and feed me stuff through my Notion page that I always have open in front of me. If there's something I've missed or something I've got wrong or something I need to ask more about. So that brings us to the end of this little podcast setup session. Thank you guys for <laughs> setting everything up while I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs on my laptop. Uh, we are now going to switch the entire studio up into main channel filming mode, which is also going to be live stream mode. So cue the time lapse. All right, so this is one of our filming setups for the main channel. Uh, essentially, here is the vibe. So we are still using the Aperture 300D Mark II, um, but it is now connected to this, um, what's it called, the Space Dome? No, it's not, it's called the Light Dome. The Light Dome, that's what it's called. And this is a very nice, soft and flattering light, which is coming at me from 45 degrees. We're not bothering with like the whole hair light and the whole backlight. Uh, we, uh, I mean, we sort of have some of that stuff automatically because of the light on the ceiling, for example, uh, but it's not something we're actively optimizing for, uh, sort of following the Peter McKinnon method of just lighting with a single video, uh, lighting with a single light. So essentially, I sit on this piano stool, which is for that piano over there, um, and then I can present to the camera. That is a Sony a7S III with a 50 millimeter G Master lens on it that we usually have at a fairly low f-stop, uh, which is a wide aperture, which makes the background nice and blurry. Audio wise, we are connected up to the Sennheiser MKH416 microphone, which is connected to this um, thingy stand, microphone stand thingy. And it's plugged in via XLR into the Sony XLR K3M, which is this fancy gizmo that we have on top of the camera, which accepts an XLR input. And we'll record backup audio from this, but the audio from this microphone is trash because it's far away and the microphone's a bit crap. 
um, but this is where our proper audio comes from. Now, the nice thing about this is that the microphone is not visible in shot, which is good because it means I can just do my thing, I can talk, I can write, I can do stuff, and it doesn't look as if I've got a microphone in my face, which is just like uh, an aesthetic vibe that I like. And normally if I'm doing a main channel video, I wouldn't be wearing a lovelier microphone, but I'm doing it because we're filming this as a studio tour. The other exciting thing about the setup is we have set up an overhead rig, or rather Gordon and the team <laughs> have set up an overhead rig, which is awesome, which means like I often like to do these sorts of videos where I'm writing stuff and drawing diagrams, and that's like my jam in terms of how I like to explain things. Overhead rigs are also really useful for tech videos. So for example, if I was, I don't know, someone chuck me a, that tripod thing, please. If I was, for example, doing a review of an iPhone and it was Gordon's iPhone, then I might be like, oh, hello, it's a child. Maybe we don't want that in shot. But this would be what the overhead camera would be seeing. And it, you know, it's kind of nice. You can do that. We've got it on autofocus. It's kind of cool. This sort of looks like what you would imagine a tech YouTuber to be doing. And it's connected via HDMI to this monitor where I can see what's going on so that I can kind of position things in frame. Like, yeah, some of that, some of this, some of that. And it's nice, it's nice having an overhead rig where, especially because I can draw diagrams, that's my jam. And one of the great things about having a studio and having a team around me who can help set up cameras is that it just takes <laughs> quite a long time to set up something like this and, making, and, and make it look good. Um, and so in terms of leverage on my own time, basically I am most useful when I'm either speaking to a camera or when I'm planning and writing videos. I am a lot less useful when I'm the one who's setting up cameras. And so it's great that we've got the team around me who can do that. And so while they were setting up those, I was planning the next video that we're going to film today, which means we can just bang out multiple videos in a single sitting, which is an important part of being a part-time YouTuber. Because even now, even though I no longer have a day job as being a doctor like I used to for the first three years of the channel, we still only work on the YouTube channel one day a week. So Thursdays are our YouTube day and everything else is done on other days. So I would still consider myself a bit of a part-time YouTuber. So this is one potential uh, setup for the desk. Uh, the nice thing is that this table is on wheels, which means that we can also wheel it around. So sometimes we wheel the table around and I sit over here and you know, it's this sort of setup with those posters behind me and the table over here which is kind of nice sometimes. I do kind of prefer the oblique angles because we get the daylight outside and I do like the idea of kind of, yeah, just having, having actual natural light in the background visible in the video. And we also sometimes put the table over here. And so, <laughs> you know, the camera might be over there. I might be sitting here with the table potentially with that stuff behind me. And it just means that we can sort of change things up a little bit. The other thing that we do in terms of changing things up is I sometimes sit on the floor. Well, where's our little table? So. Because I like to have a table in front of me. Oh my God. Sometimes I will sit on the floor and we'll do a video like this and we'll bring the light over and stuff. And I'll be like, hey guys, today we're talking all about blah, 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 blah. This was the setup we had for the why I'm leaving medicine video. Sometimes we change things, to change things up even more and I maybe move back a bit. And like, I think sitting on the floor is like an underrated way of getting like cool shots. Could even sit like, I'm not, I'm not sure we've done a video from this angle, but this would be reasonable as well. Maybe we have. I can't even remember, <laughs> but yeah. Basically, it's about kind of using the same space and using exactly the same gear and just changing things up a little bit so that people hopefully can recognize the studio that we're in um, and recognize the background and the vibe. It's very sort of white and blue and green with books in the background and lamp in the background and guitar and ukulele in the background. But hopefully it's not, it, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if anyone actually cares about this, but I, like the, I, I aesthetically like the fact that we occasionally change things up when it comes to the style that stuff is filmed in. A few other modifications that we've made to the space, uh, which are not necessarily obvious at first glance. So firstly, the lights that, we, that this place came with are quite yellow, and you can kind of see the yellow poking through the lights. But Gordon very kindly put these blue film things on it, so it makes a yellow light with a blue filter, makes it look more cold, more white, more like daylight, rather than tungsten. I personally hate yellow lighting and warm lighting like that. So I just love it when things are daylight because I tend to be more of a daylight kind of guy rather than a tungsten kind of guy. The other cool thing is that we've added these sort of blue-ish sunglasses, ND filters, whatever you want to call it, to the windows because what we were finding was that, especially in broad daylight, the sunlight levels would change quite a lot. And then you would get like really harsh sunlight coming onto the background or if we had a podcast onto the guest's face. And this just sort of evens out the light a little bit 
adds a little bit of darkness to the room, which is just generally nice and a little bit more dramatic. And the other benefit of this is that like, if we're exposing for my face, a bit technical in terms of lighting, but if we're exposing for my face, it means that the background is also then exposed appropriately. And so through this, we can actually see what's in the background. Whereas not through this, depending on the lighting level, sometimes the background becomes overexposed and it just looks a little bit, again, it's all about these little minor tweaks aesthetically. I'm not sure if anyone actually cares in terms of the audience, but what I'm hoping is that A, I care, and therefore it's nice because ultimately I need to be proud of the videos that we're making. And secondly, what I'm hoping is that there's just this subconscious appreciation of like, oh, this is a nice aesthetic. And it's kind of like with movies, there's so much effort and TV shows that goes into the production of movies, and most people won't notice or won't know exactly what's going on, but they would appreciate, oh, this looks good. This looks like a movie, this looks like it's well shot. Final thing to mention is that the wall that this office came with was like this really dirty green color. And for the first couple of months filming in the studio, I was just really not a fan of the wall color. Um, but then when Gordon came along as our videographer, he very kindly decided one day to paint the wall a nice white color. Thank you, Becky and Chris, for the recommendation on the white paint that we were gonna use. And now the wall is white and I love, I love a good white wall. It's like a special kind of white, it sort of looks a little bit blue because the light of there is kind of a little bit blue, but yeah, it's just so much better than the slightly dirty greenish yellowy color that we initially had here in the studio. Final thing to mention on the setup front is the fact that sometimes we do videos walking around. So one of the other nice things about this particular space, and we're gonna talk more about the finances, one of the reasons why in my head I justified the ridiculously expensive nature of this tiny room is the fact that it also comes with the gallery as a co-working space and a few other spaces in the building that are really nice for filming in. And so we filmed a bunch of videos in the gallery area, which is not technically our office, but often we're the only ones in there and so we can just film videos and it looks really nice. And it's nice being able to have that flexibility when I'm filming a video to think, you know what, let's get away from the desk. This is, I just wanna have a bit of a walk around. And I find that when I'm doing videos where I'm walking around and maybe being like, hey, let's sit down over here. Let's like see what Jamie's doing. Let's like go up here, let's talk about the thing. It just feels a lot more relaxed. And I find that the more relaxed I feel in a video, A, the more fun it is to film. And B, I, I hope, again, I don't know what the audience feels internally, but I'm hoping that level of ease and relaxation comes across to the audience. And so wherever possible, I just try and relax myself. Like right now, it's actually quite hot in here. I feel like I haven't really taken a breath. I am feeling the sense of like almost, ugh, kind of doing this thing. And so what I'm reminding myself is, hey, it's all good. I can take a break. This is chill. And the more chill I am filming a video, yeah, the happier I feel. Before we continue, I just wanna say that if you like what's going on here, if you've gotten to this point in the video and you like the idea of maybe having a business like this of your own someday, maybe smaller, maybe bigger, like whatever that looks like, if you're interested in the idea of becoming a creator, then you might like to check out my completely free online class called YouTube for Beginners. And that is available over at Skillshare who are very kindly sponsoring this video. If you haven't heard by now, Skillshare is the world's best place to learn anything on the internet. They've got thousands of online classes from all sorts of subjects including entrepreneurship and cooking and interior design and web design and video editing. But the best part about Skillshare is that I have about a dozen classes on there. And if you are one of the first 1000 people to click on the link in the video description, you will get free access to Skillshare for a month. You can try it completely risk-free for a whole month. And in that month, you can check out all of my classes to your heart's content, including my YouTube for beginners class, which is four hours long and teaches you everything you need to know to get started with YouTube. We've had loads of comments about that course being like, oh my God, this is incredible. And you can also check out my studying course. If you happen to be a student and you want to figure out how to be more effective with your studying so that you can maybe do stuff on the side in your spare time, like maybe be a YouTuber if you want, you can check out my evidence-based how to study for exams class completely for free over at Skillshare. So if you're one of the first thousand people to hit the link in the video description, you will get a free trial. And thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Uh, let's continue with it. All right. So that's it from a setup point of view. Let's now talk all about the finances. And so we are going <laughs> to do our little setup-y thingy over here. When it comes to talking about the finances, make sure this is appropriately aligned. Get that out of the way. All right, so when it comes to the finances, I'll just tell you how much this place costs. This place costs 10,800 pounds a month plus VAT, value added tax, but we get a reclaim on that because we're a VAT registered business. And so really 10,800 pounds a month is the number that we think about. Now, this is quite a lot. When I told my mom that number, she was just like, oh my God, how are you, how the hell are you paying so much money for this place? And yes, it is a lot. And we're just gonna talk about like what you get for that and is it worth it? Which is kind of like the question that I wanna, wanna try and answer in this video. So 10,800 pounds a month for this, this space, which is admittedly kind of small. The reason it's expensive is A, because of the location, because it's bang in the middle of central London and everything in central London is stupidly expensive. And secondly, because the kind of co-working space that we're in is kind of upmarket 
it's sort of a slightly more upmarket version of WeWork, and so that there's a sort of price tag associated with that. But in return, what you get for that is a totally managed space. We don't have to worry about cleaning. We don't have to worry about replenishing the coffee machine and cleaning the bathrooms, replacing the toilet paper, all of the other stuff that you might need to have an office manager for if we were gone, going to a completely bare bones commercial building. Having said that, it is still very expensive. It's very much the higher end of what you would pay even in central London, just because of the fanciness of the building and the fanciness of the amenities in the building. So is the place worth it? Well, to figure out whether it's worth it, let's um, kind of break down the cost into a few separate things. So the first one is hot desking. What do I mean by this? Now, if you have a business, if you are working hybrid, that kind of stuff, you might be familiar with the idea of co-working spaces, where, for example, with WeWork, uh, you can pay 300 pounds per person per month, and that will give you a hot desk pass where anyone, where the person can then use any WeWork in the country or in the world. And that's what me and Angus and the rest of the team used to do back when I was in Cambridge. We'd have a hot desk pass, so we just go to the local WeWork every day. Now, if that's 300 quid per person per month, uh, and let's say we have 10 people on our team who are sort of in and out regularly enough for that to be worth it, that comes to a total cost of 3,000 pounds per month. And the fact that we have this office building means by default, like included as part of this 10,800, we also get the hot desking privileges that come with our team being able to rock up to any of these co-working spaces in London. So if we assume that, you know, let's take WeWork as like the kind of price anchor for the market and say that that perk is worth about 3,000 pounds a month, that leaves us with 7,800 pounds for the studio itself, the fact that this place is a private office. Now, beyond the fact that we have people working here, which is kind of nice, uh, but we could, we could have that with the hot desks, what's the point of the private office? Well, basically it's a room that we can film things in. We can film YouTube videos and we can film podcasts. Now, what would the alternative be? I could just film things in my living room or bedroom like I used to for the last four years, uh, but I decided when I moved to London that I didn't want to do that. I don't like the fact that there's cameras and lights and stands and cables and stuff everywhere. And it was sort of affecting my personal life to have people over and then there not being a place to sit because there's too many cameras around. So I decided that I was going to have a separate place, a separate bedroom for filming. Now, let's say in central London, the place I'm renting, let's say I wanted to have an extra bedroom that I used for filming. Let's say videos and podcasts, just a single room. In central London, that would cost, you know, conservatively, another sort of 1500 pounds per month for a bedroom that's big enough to film YouTube videos and podcasts in. And so that would be the amount that we would be paying anyway based on this extra bedroom. And so that comes out to the remainder is 6,300 pounds per month, which is essentially what we're paying, the premium that we're paying for this to be the room that we film in rather than for a random bedroom in my house to be the room that we film in. And so the question is, is it worth it? And pff, there's a few different ways of figuring out the ROI, the return on investment on something. The first one is monetary. And I guess the way that we think about it is, have we generated more than 6,300 pounds a month worth of value by virtue of having the space? Does having the space mean that we film more videos, for example, than if we were just in my house? The answer is probably not, to be honest. Other than this studio tour video, <laughs> there is basically no other video we've done where we would not have done the video had we been in just a bedroom in a house. So monetarily, this does not seem worth it because it's not allowed us to create any more videos. What about the other ways of, of defining ROI? One of the other benefits of having an office and having the team all together in person is that it benefits from serendipity. Like, you know, let's say I'm going to the coffee machine to grab a coffee. Tommy, our YouTuber Academy director is there and he and I are just having a bit of a chat and we come up with an idea for something. And that idea is like, ooh, we wouldn't have come up with this idea had we not just been casually chatting over coffee. There's no way in hell we would have come, with that, come up with that idea over Zoom because it would have required us to have a specific meeting for the thing. But the fact that we were together in person and just happened to have this water cooler moment where we came up with a cool idea could theoretically add large amounts of value to the business. And we've had lots of these conversations over the last year here amongst the team where we've started new projects or we've shut down projects or we've done cool things that have generated revenue as a result of this serendipity. The question is, would we have had that had we just done the hot desking thing? The answer is, yeah, quite possibly. Um, if we were all, in theory, in, in a WeWork, hot desking, all around there in person, we still benefit from the serendipitous effects of being in person without the extra 6,300 pound a month cost of having a private office. And so again, it's not, it's not worth it from an ROI perspective on that front. But there is something that is like, like a nice thing to have with having a private office, which is that the vibes are just really good. Like when you're hot desking, when you're like in a library or something, there is a level of like, you have to be mindful of the other people around you. You don't want to have too many loud conversations. You don't necessarily want to play music because there's other people around. Whereas this is our completely private space. We can do whatever we want with the space. And so we have had really nice vibes in the office. We've made, made some fond memories. People have become really good friends. I've become friends with a bunch of people in the team. Um, and so 
really we are paying <laughs> this 6,300 pounds a month for extra vibes. Was it worth it? <sighs> Again, pr realistically, I've got to say probably not. Like it's quite a lot of money to pay and we could have had those vibes through other things that were a lot cheaper had we intentionally created them. But the reason why we got the space in London is because to be honest, I've been working from home on this YouTube channel for the last four years. And when I moved to London, the business was doing ridiculously well, our margins are super high. And I was thinking, you know what? Let's just try it as a bit of an experiment. It's not something I'm likely to regret. I don't imagine, you know, a few years from now, I'll look back and think, oh, I really regret spending all this time in an office. I really regret spending all that money on the office. I'm more likely to think, huh, we tried it out. I was curious to see what it's like working in a normal office environment, having the team all around me. And yeah, it was a good experiment to run and we've been running that experiment for a year now. So what are we gonna do moving forward? I think having realized that this office and an office of this size is not really worth it because it's also not really fit for, for purpose. It's kind of annoying that no one is able to really work in here while we're filming stuff. And because we're always filming stuff, whether it's vid videos or podcasts or our YouTuber Academy sessions or courses, there's actually very little time for the team to just sort of hang out and work, which was the intention of having people there in person. So what we're probably gonna do for next year in, an, in the next couple of months is move to more of a hybrid model whereby we have an extra two bedrooms in the place where I live, one studio for the YouTube channel, one studio for the podcast, and we give everyone kind of WeWork or equivalent or some kind of co-working co -working space membership hot desk passes so that when we're working in person and all together, we are in the local WeWork, for example, but once a week or twice a week on filming days, when we're filming videos for the YouTube channel or courses or the podcast, then me and Angus and Gordon or whoever else on the team is just involved with filming, we basically go to my house and we film in the YouTube bedroom or in the podcast bedroom. And I think that's gonna be the next experiment that we run. Honestly, a big part of running this kind of business at this stage, there isn't really a playbook for it. There are other huge creators in the US, you know, Linus Tech Tips and MKBHD who have enormous warehouses, enormous offices, and like in Linus's case, an absolutely huge team. We're sort of trying to do something maybe similar, but maybe not. Different kind of businesses, different kind of ambitions. But really the way I think of it, it's all about running experiments and see what works for you. So that brings us to the end of this studio tour. If you liked this and you're interested in creating your own creatorpreneur business or whatever, you might like to check out this, this video over here, which is my three level guide to growing on YouTube. This is the method, I guess, that I've kind of reverse engineered from having grown on YouTube over the last five years and now been in this ridiculously privileged position to have this kind of studio. But this gives you in half an hour the, all the entire method that you need to know to get started with this YouTube stuff to become a creator for yourself. So thank you so much for watching. Do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.